All right, so welcome to another life science lecture or another biology lecture. So as I said, we continue to just revise past papers so that you can be well equipped for your final examination. And uh, biology multiple choice carries 40 marks. Uh, apologies, this cover page was literally upside down for some weird reason. So it covers, uh, uh, we have uh, a list of four options, A, B, C, and D, multiple choice. And as usual, you have to click an X on the correct answer. So 2020, so today, bear with me, we're going to attempt to answer half of these questions. And then we're going to do the other half next week on Friday. So do stay tuned uh, for this lecture and make sure you watch this video and practice as usual. All right, so let's get uh, to it. Okay, so um, our first question, I'll be using the highlighter to sort of explain things. So our first question is, uh, which, of, which of the following is not a characteristic of living organisms? So the keyword is all living organisms. I don't know why they put this not. I suppose it is one of the keywords, but the major keyword is all living organisms. Because if we look at the classification system, we've got a um, uh, plant kingdom, uh, animal kingdom, we have got our Achaea, Achaea kingdom, and uh, bacteria, and bacteria, uh, bacteria kingdom. So the question is saying which of the following is not a characteristic of all living organisms? So here we're talking about uh, nutrition. We're talking about the way these living organisms obtain and utilize um, food energy. And not all living organisms photosynthesize. All these living organisms have an excretion pathway, they have a reproduction pathway, either asexually or sexually, and they also have some form of respiration cycle, like an electron transport chain either aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration, but not all living organisms are photosynthesized. Not all living organisms carry out autotrophic nutrition. We only have plants that carry out autotrophic nutrition. So our answer here will be B, which is photosynthesis. All right, so let's uh, try to analyze the second question. Let's try and analyze the second question. So our second question here, we're saying the diagram below shows a mesophyll, a cell of a, of a leaf. So what characteristics do we see here? So the first thing that we see here is one being the cell uh, wall, two being the cell membrane, Uh, two being the nucleus, three, uh, oh sorry, four being the cytoplasm, and uh, people, this is a mesophyll cell, so we obviously, a, a mesophyll layer is specialized for photosynthesis, so we obviously expect uh, um, organelle number five to be a, chloro, a chloroplast. So now the question is saying, after we've labeled the diagram and identified all these uh, cellular organelles, we can now go forth and answer this question. Which labeled structures are not found in liver cells of a human being? So this question is just saying, what are the two uh, most common things that you cannot find in an animal cell? So the answer being a cell wall, which is one, and your chloroplast, which is five. So we expect our answer to have one and five. So we go where we, it says one and five, which is option C. See the thinking process, I hope you follow, and I hope you revise and watch this video over and over again. So question three, maybe let's use blue. Uh, the diagram below shows an experiment to demonstrate the movement of molecules. We've got a beaker there, uh, we've got water, uh, an inverted funnel, and red ink, and a selectively permeable uh, membrane. 
So what's going to happen here? Because every time you see a selectively permeable membrane, we're talking about water moving out and red ink is here. So the red ink here is in high concentration. So what's going to happen is that the water that's in uh, the ink uh, solution, that's in high concentration here is going to start moving across this selectively permeable membrane until we have some sort of uh, equal distribution. And because we have this selectively permeable membrane, we're talking about uh, the process of um, osmosis. So we do expect uh, this beaker to have an equal distribution of molecules at the end known as a state of equilibrium. And the process is um, actually, uh, what's this? The, the process is actually diffusion, not osmosis, because it's not water that's moving, it's this red ink solution. So actually the process has to be diffusion and the net uh, reaction has to be equilibrium. So let's uh, see what we have here. After an hour, the water in the beaker turned red. What is the most likely reason for the color change? Uh, molecules. So we're saying molecules, they're not moving by osmosis because uh, osmosis is water. So we're talking about molecules of the red ink. Red ink. We don't know the molecular composition of this red ink, but it's definitely not water. If it was water, we would have said they moved by osmosis, but this is definitely a diffusion type of question. So we're saying molecules of the red ink moved. Uh, so molecules of the red ink moved through the membrane by diffusion. So red ink move uh, through the membrane by diffusion until equilibrium is uh, reached. So please make sure this is not osmosis because the red ink molecules are not water. When we're talking about movement, so they tricked you here by saying uh, a selectively permeable membrane. So selectively permeable membrane is directly related to osmosis, but here what's moving is not water. What's moving is the red ink molecules. So they are moving from a region of where they are in a high concentration in the inverted uh, uh, thistophanel to a region where they are in uh, no concentration in the beaker water until equilibrium is reached. So be careful with that. Again, ECZ does not publish their answer scripts. So there is no point of uh, revision. I personally believe that the ECZ website should have a digital copy of all exams with all answer sheets for the benefits of the Zambian citizens for free so that we all access a database of questions. But that's not the, that's not the, the reality on the ground. All right, so let's look at question four. It says uh, the graph below shows the effects of pH on a particular enzyme controlled reaction. So here at the top of this uh, graph here, we're talking about the optimum pH. Optimum pH. And I want you to understand this word um, denature. Denature. So every time an enzyme has got a specific active site, so this region here is known as the active site. And due to changes in pH or due to changes in high temperature, this active site is going to become distorted. It's going to change. And if this active site changes, the enzyme becomes denatured and it won't be able to catalyze that reaction. The, a good example that I like to give in terms of uh, teaching enzymes when I'm talking about an enzyme being denatured, imagine you have got a hot pot there with a lot of boiling water, and then you get a plastic uh, bottle. This plastic bottle, you can open it, it's, uh, it's very good, you can use it to store a certain volume of water, but once you put it in boiling water, it's going to sort of lose its shape. And once it loses its shape, it loses its function. You won't be able to use it as well. So because it's changed its shape, it can no longer work. 
So an enzyme being deactive is the active site of this enzyme is going to be compromised either by changes in temperature or changes in pH. And here we have got a base level of the graph. At point one, the enzyme is not working, but in this region, the enzyme is definitely working up to optimum temperature, or oh, sorry, rather optimum pH. At this stage, the enzyme is definitely working, but the active site is actively changing until this level here where there is no longer any enzyme activity. So the question which says, at which point is the enzyme not active is at this label. So it should be at one and 13. So the answer should be A, at one and at 13, where we have no change in our graph. Okay, I see a food test here and I see purple. So purple means proteins. Uh, proteins means a burette reagent. So which of the following food nutrients would produce a purple color when mixed with burette reagent? The answer is proteins. And I'm going to explain the nature of that during my virtual lab for biology practicals. I'm planning on doing a virtual lab uh, for everyone so that you can all see uh, this virtual biology lab in food tests. So every time you see purple, that's burette reagent. Burette reagent, it's a, uh, oh, did I say called reducing sugar? Sorry. The answer is proteins. So our answer here is proteins. Okay, so question six. We're saying now, uh, which of the following correctly identifies disorders caused by vitamin C, roughage, as well as protein. So as usual, a vitamin C, there's an old scavy tale for vitamin C where these uh, sailors were on board of a ship and their teeth were very uh, decayed until they started uh, carrying uh, lemons on board. It was, real, it was discovered that actually lemon contains vitamin C. So these ship people started sucking on lemons and they never developed scurvy. So vitamin C is definitely scurvy. Uh, then we're talking about roughage. Every time you have got constipation, you don't have enough roughage in your diet. So this is constipation. And what else are protein? Well, we talk about protein energy malnutrition, which is kwashioka. Kwashioka, where you have uh, this child with um, a very big uh, stomach, but very thin uh, extremities, very thin hands, very weak uh, legs. That's protein energy malnutrition. So the answer should be follow fruit, follow this sequence, uh, which says uh, vitamin C, scurvy, constipation, and kwashioka. So our answer here will be D. Okay, so this question is stupid. Sorry, ECZ, you don't ask questions like this. So I, I'm talking about question seven. Which of the following plant nutrients keeps the cell membrane healthy? Cell membrane is macro, sorry, it's a micromolecular structure. It's a phospholipid bilayer. So the answer here is actually supposed to be phosphate because literally a, a cell membrane is made up of hydrophilic heads, which are made up of phosphates and a tail which is made up of a hydrophobic layer of uh, lipids. So here we we'll have a cell membrane like that and the answer should be phosphate, but we we'll just put potassium for now, but the answer should be phosphate. And you, you don't say cell membrane when you're talking about uh, plant macronutrients, you have to talk about a macroscopic uh, analysis. You have to talk about the root system, the stem, and also the leaves. So how are we supposed to, what class of nutrients are supposed to keep the root stem and leaves healthy? You don't talk about cellular structures and ask a question like this, no. So if there's any examiner watching this video right now, please do not uh, ask students such questions. They're just very confusing to uh, a student. All right, so let's look at these people. Another question that doesn't. Okay, so the diagram below shows a section through a leaf 
which cell type absorbs most carbon dioxide during the day. So they are talking about photosynthesis. But here, we're talking about absorbs carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide comes through in the lower part of the leaf at this area here. At this area here where we have got a guard cell, a guard cell and um, the, the stoma here. So the cell that actually absorbs most of the carbon dioxide is this cell here, the gut cell, because it controls the opening when it can open up and close to allow gaseous exchange to take place on the lower part. But here, since the question is talking about photosynthesis, so we have to target this palisade layer here. Actually, this palisade layer is actually specialized to absorb absorb light energy so it absorbs a certain wavelength, uh, wavelength of light and using carbon dioxide uh, in, uh, using carbon dioxide we uh, make glucose and release oxygen so this question was wrongly asked the correct answer has to be the gut cell because that's the one that absorbs uh, carbon dioxide but here they are telling us uh, photosynthesis and they are, they are giving us a keyword during the day. So we're going to say uh, B as our answer. Not the epidemics, the upper ep epidemic layer, not this transport system there, or not this mesophyll, uh, spongy mesophyll layer. We're going to talk about this palisade cell layer. But again, this question, every time you're preparing exam questions make them as clear as possible to the point do your research uh, don't just go on the internet and copy and paste uh, questions all right so this is the fungus and uh, every fungus carries out a type of nutrition known as saprophytic saprophytic nutrition so this is where we feed on dead and decaying matter, dead and decaying matter. And this is a, an asexual reproduction system. And labeling this diagram, remember biology, we're talking about structure and function. So every time we talk about structure, there is no uh, better way around it. You just have to memorize. So the upper part here is the sporongium. Then this part here is the sporangiophore. And these are the, the rhizoids, the rhizoids. So this is the structure of this saprophytic fungi and they say so sporongium. So our answer is B. So the following is the dental formula of a dog. So this notation of dental formula only shows one half, one half, oh, one half over the jaw. So we have uh, upper jaw, lower jaw, one half symmetrically, upper jaw, lower jaw, the other half. So I'm saying four, uh, 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 two, three, uh, four, four, one, one, three, three. So that makes 21, meaning this side, we should also have the same arrangement. Two, three, uh, four, four, one, one, three, three. So all in total, we have to have 21 this side, 21 this side, meaning every dog should have about 42 teeth in total. So that makes a two upper part, two molars upper part, two molars on the upper jaw. So the total has to be four. So our answer here is C. So the key here, you have to understand that this notation only just shows one half, just shows one half. The other half has to be accounted for. So you get uh, the upper molars and multiply by two to make uh, four, uh, molars in the upper jaw and then three molars on the um oh sorry six molars on the lower jaw so something like that so the answer has to be uh four remember it's just one half okay so question 11 says the diagram below shows part of the human digestive system so just part of the human digestive system and what do we have here so here we've got uh, the stomach 
have got the pancreas there we have got the liver there and this is the gallbladder uh, which of the organs a b c d carries uh, carries out the amination of excess amino acids so this is the liver so our answer is b so the liver carries out the amination of excess amino acids changing those uh, amino acids uh, some of the products is um, the amino acid the amino acid chains are converted to uh, they, they release ammonia then the ammonia is conjugated to make urea which is less toxic and it's excreted via the kidneys okay where are we question 12 uh, gaseous exchange so this one our uh, human beings gaseous exchange takes place in the alveoli in fish it's in the gills and tracheolis uh, in insects like the usually the whole lot of the abdomen of the insects so our answer here is a not wasting time okay so which what is the what is produced during uh, an aerobic respiration so during an aerobic respiration in the absence of uh, oxygen two things are produced we have got lactic acid that's in easter uh, we have got lactic acid and we have got carbon dioxide uh, the uh, the lactic acid can evaporate off and in terms of yeast Actually, wait, yeast, yeast, don't we produce um, ethanol? Yeah, in yeast, we, we actually produce ethanol, not lactic acid. So ethanol and uh, carbon dioxide, uh, no wonder yeast is used for baking because once you are in the oven, the ethanol is going to uh, evaporate off and then the carbon dioxide is going to help rise your dough. So it's, it's actually ethanol, not lactic acid. So X on lactic acid, cross on uh, carbon dioxide, our answer should be C. So which of the following is a pathogenic disease? So cholera is caused by Vibrio bacteria. So this is definitely pathogenic because it's a bacterial infection. Uh, coronary heart disease is caused by constriction of blood vessels so you are going to find fatty plaques being uh, building up on the walls of the blood vessels causing this constriction uh, then the blood vessels will not have supply of oxygen then that will there will be ischemia ischemic heart disease no oxygen being supplied to the heart then they are going to die uh, sickle cell anemia is caused by a point mutation that causes certain segments of the amino acid chains, I think it's valin, have been a point mutation that changes one amino acid, a one point mutation, I'm not so sure, I think I've forgotten, should be valin. Just one point mutation causes a normal red blood cell in the presence of oxygen to, to go from that normal curved, uh, biconcave disc shape to a lunar sickle shell form so this is a genetic disorder and then scurvy this is a vitamin disorder vitamin c so our answer here is cholera so which conditions of humidity which conditions of humidity uh, light intensity and temperature increase the rate of transpiration so transpiration where well, the plant is losing more water because it's very hot so high light intensity low humidity but very high temperature so our answer is a uh, which of the following components is responsible for clotting blood so um, erythrocytes erythrocytes this um, this is the other term for red blood cells erythro means red uh, lymphocytes and phagocytes these are your immune cells these are your immune cells and uh, platelets these are the ones that clot so these are for coagulation coagulation or blood clotting 
we will discuss the coagulation cascade if we discover questions in that in paper two of our biology. Okay, so question seven. Oh my goodness, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so we have got this diagram here. So this um, so this should be the inferior vena cover. Inferior vena cover. And then this is carrying the oxygenated blood to the lungs. So it has to be the pulmonary uh, vein. And this is carrying uh, oxygenated blood from the lungs. So this has to be the pulmonary. Oh, sorry, this is actually the pulmonary artery. Oh no, pulmonary. Uh, yeah, pulmonary artery. And this is pulmonary vein. And then this here is your aorta. Uh, so now they are saying uh, which carries oxygenated blood at low pressure. So the low pressure system is at your right side of the heart. Yeah, the, your right side of the heart carries a low pressure system but your left side of the heart is all high pressure. So this side is definitely all high pressure, whether it's pulmonary vein or aorta, it's all high pressure. But the answer here has to be B, based on their, their demeanor here saying low pressure. Actually, both pulmonary vein and aorta are high pressure systems because they are on the left side of the heart. All oxygenated blood carriers are high pressure systems. So you do not have to say at high pressure so that you confuse whether I'm going to say pulmonary vein or aorta, because this is from the heart to the rest of the body. So this, the, the aorta is definitely high pressure, but we'll say uh, B. Okay, so question 18, for a kidney to work, uh, you, you don't need to memorize these values, but you just have to know that your kidney has a filtration system that filtration system keeps uh, glucose and amino acids away and actively reabsorbed into your blood system because you need glucose in your body, you need amino acids in your body, so you do not want any glucose in your urine, a condition called glucosiuria, or uh, amino acids or proteins in your urine, a condition called proteinuria, so it has to be virtually zero. So our ideal answer here has to be A. Um, what is the percent composition of the above chemicals in the urine of a healthy person? Zero glucose, that means zero glucosiuria, uh, zero protein, meaning zero proteinuria, and we just want the toxic things out, which are uh, the urea. So question 19, the graph shows the air temperature. Okay. The graph shows the air temperature and body temperature during uh, 24 hours. Okay. Uh, which mechanism may help maintain the body temperature between 18 and 24 hours? So if we look at this graph, between 18 and 24 hours, the temperature is uh, below 18 degrees Celsius. So to maintain the body temperature, there will actually be active vasoconstriction. So we have to say vasoconstriction of arterials near the surface, um, near the skin surface. So that mechanism controls body temperature. So uh, let me highlight this endocrinology. The diagram shows the endocrine glands of the human body. Which hormones are produced by the glands R, S, and T? Again, they've made a mistake here because I'm seeing antidiuretic hormone and I'm seeing the pituitary gland. So they are saying R is the pituitary gland. Then uh, S, it's the adrenal gland. And then T is the pancreas. So what secretes antidiuretic hormone is actually the hypothalamus. 
then the, the so the hypothalamus secretes antidiuretic hormone and then it's uh, secreted via the pituitary gland. So when you say produced, ADH is hypothalamus, then releasing is the pituitary, but we'll forgive them. So ADH matches with a pituitary gland, the adrenal gland matches with adrenaline, then uh, the pancreas matches with insulin. We have got uh, the beta cells in the pancreas that secrete uh, insulin. So here our answers to be RAST, RADH, ADH, uh, S, adrenaline, T, insulin. So this is our answer. So please watch out for our next biology video where we're going to look at uh, question 21 to 40. We'll look at this reflex, simple reflex arc, um, more on uh, neurology and uh, nerve cells. Okay, uh, some form of reproductive system. These are all simple questions. Uh, biology shouldn't give you a headache. You just have to revise enough past papers and study. So I'm going to end this video here. Uh, I'll see you in the next uh, class. Uh, bye.